Joining us now is our CAA basketball insider, Eamon Brennan. Eamon, we'll get right to it. Obviously, the headline going into the early start of conference season has to be William & Mary, 5-0 and with a lot of good wins on the road so far early in conference play. What have you liked from the Tribe? I mean, yeah, it's been a fantastic start for William & Mary. I think if you're looking at uh, the conference as a whole right now, the one story that will really jump out at you is William & Mary. I mean, it's a team that was picked seventh. And, you know, to, to begin the league um, uh, coming into this season, the team that I think had some clearly some quality players in Nathan Knight um, and and some guys around him. But I don't know that the expectations were necessarily there for. And you look at what they've done so far. They look to me, at least right now, kind of far and away the best team um, in the league, although they'll have competition. And I'm sure we'll get to that. But just their ability to, a, as you said, go on the road and, and get wins is we saw that early in the year when we talked about them, um, their road performances in non-conference play and true road games, which um, you don't see all that often, was really impressive. Um, and they've carried that through, you know, into league play with three straight wins to open the season at Elon, at Hofstra, at Northeastern, the latter of those two, two of their main competitors um, for, the, for the conference title this season. Um, and yeah, they're, they're off and running. I think it's a really, really impressive team in a variety of ways. Um, and you see what they were last year and what they are this year and the pieces they put around Nathan Knight and a guy like Andy Van Vliet, a uh, seven-foot guy who can play out on the wing. Um, they have more balance and versatility on offense. Thornton Scott, there he's had some injury issues here and there, but they're 9-0 and when he's played as a sort of a three-point specialist, helped stretch the floor. Uh, and as we've talked about a lot with William and Mary, um, it's really helped balance their offense out this year, that sort of inside-out attack with Nathan Knight. Uh, Luke Lowy typically guards the opposition's best perimeter player, and that's a big part of the reason why William & Mary's defense has improved um, the way it has this year. Again, offense still driving them, but, but the Tribe are much better on the defensive end, and he's been a, a huge part of, of the reason why. And this Tribe team kind of has a new identity when you look at them going into this year. Obviously, first-year head coach Dane Fisher comes in, and, and – this tribe team used to be more known for their offense and high pace and shooting a lot of threes. And now it's a more defensive team and they're using big guys. Yeah, it's a, it's a more defensive team. As we just mentioned, they're one of the best defensive rebounding teams. Um, one of the 30, 35 best in the country. And it makes sense because you look at a guy like Nathan Knight, great rebounder on both ends of the floor, um, great interior scorer, but can get it done on the defensive end. Um, and you put him alongside another, you know, a seven foot guy in Van Vliet who is probably just as good, if not, not uh, better as a defensive rebounder. Um, and so when opposing teams shoot the ball against William and Mary, it's pretty simple calculus. If the ball doesn't go in the hoop, um, more often than not, William and Mary ends that possession and gets to, um, you know, get down to business on the offensive end. Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a more balanced team. I mean, they are better defensively, significantly better defensively. They really struggled on that on the floor last year and, and they're closer to average this year. I think maybe the biggest uptick for me has actually come on the offensive end where they were good last year, um, but are better this year. I mean, they're top seven in the country, right now, seventh uh, in the country in, in effective field goal percentage of 55.5. Um, they're one of the 20 or 25 best teams in terms of percentage from both inside the arc and outside the arc. Um, they're a much, much better free throw shooting team, which was sort of sneakily one of, a, one of their big issues a season ago. Um, and yeah, and you just, you sort of look up and down the team. It's just a, it's a really solid looking, really interesting team thus far. And uh, slightly new identity, but also just much better at the things um, they were both good at last year and, and the things they really struggled at. One of those teams that William & Mary defeated just recently this past weekend was College of Charleston. They are 5-1. and one. What have you liked from them thus far? Well, primarily Grant Riller, and there's not much not to like about, about Grant Riller's game at this point. He's been such a good player for Charleston for years now, and he's carried that through into his senior year. Um, really kind of does – a little bit of everything and, and a lot of a lot of things, particularly scoring for Charleston um, in you know, three straight games, averaged essentially 30 points. He had 30 in two of them and, and 28 um, uh, in the game prior against Towson. His 30 against Elon um, were necessary and also included, you know, a, a stretch of 12 straight um, buckets in the latter portions of that game that were Charleston's last 12 points. So he's had the ball in his hands all the time. He's had the ball in his hands all the time late. He is sort of one of those players who's single-handedly capable of, of getting teams wins. And they've had improvement um, from other guys. It's Evan Galloway has been better in league play. Um, he scored in double figures in, in Charleston's first five games. 
um, wasn't in double figures in their loss to William and Mary, and maybe that's correlation, but I think there's probably more causation there. Um, and then Sam Miller has been better um, as a good sort of three and D guy, able to step away and really like Galloway when he's when he's shooting the ball well. Um, take a little bit of pressure off of the perimeter, stretch the floor a little bit, and then obviously contribute on the other end. So yeah, Charleston's had a really good start, and, and a whole lot of, of it has had to do with with Grant Miller. For the Cougars, for them, what do you, what do they need to do to stay in that upper echelon of the CAA? I think you might have hinted on it a little bit. They might need a little bit more contributing outside of just Grant Riller. Yeah, well, I mentioned it with Galloway, and I, I again, I think it's it's crucial that they get more scoring. It it can't just be like Grant Riller is really really good, but you can't just say okay, he's going to get us thirty every night, and that's going to be good enough. And it, even if he gets thirty or thirty five, if they don't have other guys consistently stepping it up. And they're going to be in trouble. But as we mentioned, Galloway has played better um, in, in league play. I think there's still another level for him to get to there. And, and I like Sam Miller as sort of a, you know, a defensive um, sort of rangy six foot nine guy, but who can do a, a few different things um, on the offensive end as well. There are pieces there for sure. And, and it's not just Grant Riller, but again, as much as he's sort of carried them and as, as good as he's been, that's probably not enough. And you would think, for them to stay at the level with a team like William and Mary, um, as well as they're playing, it's going to take a little bit more from some of those other guys on the floor. Two other teams that are near the top of the CAA standings right now had a great battle on the CBS Sports Network last Thursday night. It was Hofstra and Northeastern coming down to the wire, the pride with the buzzer-beating uh, victory over the Huskies. Uh, let's begin with Hofstra. What have you liked from them? Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to Northeastern, which um, I think was that two years in a row now that they've had a buzzer beater loss to, to Hofstra. Um, that's tough. But no, I mean, Hofstra's been been really good as well. The, the guard play um, from Eli Pemberton and, and Deshore Bowie has been, I think, the story of their season so far. Um, you know, we wondered, I think we talked about it in the preseason, losing a guy like Justin Wright Foreman, who not coincidentally hit that, that buzzer beater against Northeastern last season, um, score, you know, the Justin Wright Foreman scored 27 points a game for Hofstra last year. That's kind of crazy. And coming into the season, I think we really wondered, like, okay, how do you make up for that? It's an age-old question in college basketball every year when you lose a guy of that caliber. Um, is, is who steps up? Can you step up? Is it multiple different guys? That sort of thing. Um, and I think what we've seen is that not only has Eli Pemberton been just about as good as he always been, which is really good, uh, averaging around 16, 16 and a half points a game and 5.6 rebounds. Uh, but we've seen Deshore Bowie really step up, uh, particularly on the offensive end. He was great as a defender last year. He's the conference's defensive player of the year. This year, he's averaging almost 20 points per game, been really efficient as a ball handler. His distribution has allowed um, Hofstra's uh, sort of overall offensive balance to work. They've got five players in double figures, and a lot of that comes from Bowie as, as a ball handler comes from Pemberton's ability to draw defenders. It works really well, those guys in tandem with, with what Hofstra has going for it on the offensive end. And, and they're really leading Hofstra, I think, in ways that we maybe weren't sure. I think everyone realized Pemberton would be able to get his buckets as he always has. And he's a really solid player um, on the offensive end. You kind of know what you're going to get. But getting what they've gotten from Deshaun Bowie has been a major boost for sure. And the team that was on the losing end of that last Thursday night game that came down to the wire, Northeastern, and you've talked about this young man all year long, and Jordan Rowland, one of the most efficient players in the country right now. And, and now he's kind of have a counterpart that's developed a little bit in freshman Tyson Walker. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's huge. We have been mentioning Jordan Rowland all season. Um, he was my player of the year um, when we did sort of our non-conference check-in um, you know, sort of looking in on his efficiency again here at basically 22 points per game. He has the seventh highest offensive rating. It's like 121, 121.5 among players who use at least 24% of their team's possessions. This all comes from KenPom.com. Um, that's in the country. It is a theme that there are, um, you know, like Grant Riller at Charleston, teams in this league that, that need second scores, need more guys um, to pitch in. And we have seen that with Tyson Walker. He's been Rookie of the Week four times already, and I think um, trending toward probably the Rookie of the Year favorite in the CAA, as we, as we talked about, not only a player that is really helping this season, um, but a guy you look towards to the future um, as a potential sort of cornerstone of this program and um, emerging as a freshman like say uh, some of the freshmen at Elon who's gotten, you know, Walker has been thrown in right away. 
Um, Bill Cohen has sort of thrown him into the fire immediately. He's playing around 30 minutes per game. Um, but he's emerging really well into sort of a, a great second option, um, both in terms of usage rate and the number of touches he gets, um, but also in terms of his efficiency and, and being able to score, really stretch the floor, take some pressure off of Roland. Um, we're seeing that with Bolden Brace, I think, who is a senior who we're familiar with and who is probably the primary release valve for sort of a lot of the pressure that Roland does get defensively, shooting around 45% from three. That's a huge sort of um, gravitational pull on opposing defenses. But Walker is up in the 40% range too, and that's not only really promising for the future or after some of these guys uh, like Roland and Brace are gone, but it's, it's really helpful to have a guy like that emerge in a season like this uh, and give you sort of a wild card, something maybe you weren't quite expecting this early in his career. The CA as a whole is supposed to be one of the closest, and it has been so far, one of the closest conference races in the country, especially after the first three weeks. Just talk about the conference right now and what you like as you know some of the net ratings have come out. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing now with um, w w sort of what we, I think, predicted – as we've gone along this year, both before the season started and as we sort of checked in on the league throughout non-conference play, is that it has always sort of looked like even if there wasn't that one team that was going to um, get the non-conference wins to be sort of a, a bubble-type fixture or a potential at-large team, I don't think we're there still, even though William & Mary is obviously playing really, really well. What we are seeing is kind of what we expected throughout the non-conference season, which is that it's just a really tight race at the top. You look at William and Mary, obviously five and zero. Uh, Charleston's five and one. Hofstra's four and one. Northeastern's up there. Um, teams like Drexel, Towson, and Delaware have a couple losses already in league play. Towson has three losses in league play, but there are guys on each of those squads that you think could make could sort of help them make a run. Um, Towson played really well in its last two league games. You know, both blowout wins at home. Delaware is uh, in the process of figuring out how to. Best incorporate Dylan Painter, the Villanova transfer we've talked about in the past a fair amount, who I think is a really promising addition for that team and, and has looked good so far, was sort of, you know, had an MVP performance in a sort of 8 and 11, 7 of 8, really efficient um, game and a win over James Madison. There's, there's a lot there still. I mean, Drexel, you know, Drexel, for example, James Butler, little known fact, second in the NCAA in total rebounds. Um, he's top five in the country in double doubles. And if it weren't for Nathan Knight, who, as we've established many times, is a fantastic player and a really dominant sort of interior force uh, for William & Mary, then Butler would be leading the conference in double-doubles. So, yeah, he's been a really effective energy effort guy. Cam Winter, um, his sophomore season has going really well so far, and you can see more from him yet to come, um, sort of a high-usage guy who's really plowing through at this point. So the, the number of teams we have at the top um, – is interesting. Uh, William and Mary's around one, you know, the, the mid 100s, 106 um, in net rating as of, as of this taping, uh, Charleston's 111, um, Northeastern's at 137. So uh, there's a decent amount of, you know, sort of condensed stuff at the top. But I think when you look at the middle of the league, um, it's going to be really competitive and it's going to be a challenge for the teams like William and Mary, like Charleston um, to get through on a nightly basis because um, they'll, you know, they may not be at the level of the sort of, oh my God, this team can't lose or they're going to lose their at-large spot. It's not, we're not, that's not the calculus at this point, but they are what, what you would maybe look to as like, a, okay, they're going to rattle off 10 wins in a row in conference play. I don't know that that's going to be the case in the CAA this year. Cause I just think there's depth and there's really interesting quality players throughout the league. And you mentioned kind of the next set of tier teams there with Drexel, Towson, and Delaware. What out of those three teams in the next tier do you really like? What team that, that seems to have the pieces together that maybe, maybe have struggled a little bit early in conference play, but you could see them making a run here in the middle of the conference play and into the end of the season? Yeah, well, I think Towson has a nice little core with Brian Fobbs and Alan Beatran, player of the week. Um, big two in a week for Towson. And a guy that I don't know was on a lot of people's radar coming into the season, but he's been a sort of nice sophomore bonus um, for Pat Scary, developing to a, to a nice player and a guy that, that Towson will be able to build around. Everyone kind of has a pretty good feel for their role. I think um, that's, a, that's a good look. I also think Delaware, like we mentioned, Dylan Painter is a really talented guy. If you're talented enough to go to Villanova um, and play some, some big minutes here and there for Villanova for a team that competes for national titles in the past five years on a pretty regular basis, 
Um, you're good enough to be a major addition uh, at Delaware in, in, in the CAA and, and really make some noise. And midseason transfers are tough, right? They're, it's, it's tricky. Guys come in, they've been practicing, um, but someone has to step out of the lineup. Someone has to step in. Rotations have to get sorted out. And so I don't know if Delaware is quite there yet, but the Blue Hens have a chance to be really, really good if they can figure it out um, and sort of build some momentum down the stretch. They're a team that I would really keep an eye on. Eamon Brennan joining us today. Thank you so much for stopping by, and we'll talk to you here uh, coming up later in the conference season. Sounds great. Thank you.